So my name is Urian van Vali, and I am an associate tutor at Escape Studios. And um, I am a technical artist. So I am both, um, I find my, I'm a kind of a generalist in terms of uh, game art, where I focus both on the art and the technical side of video games, which is also a little bit of programming, where I mainly do it in visual scripting. So that's Blueprints, which is uh, what this webinar is about. And you can see on the screen here at the left hand side is a little example of uh, was a bit of my art and on the right hand side is something from my uh, VR toolkit. Hello, hello. Ah, uh, cool. People can see. That's good to know. Um, so yeah, from a VR toolkit, it's all made inside of Blueprint. And this webinar is also a little bit about showing off that essentially you can create whatever you like inside of Blueprint, right? As in, you're not limited to having to go into C++ or hardcore programming, which can be a quite daunting where Blueprint's visual scripting is a little bit more approachable and a little bit more friendly for artists between us and the people that do like it, but don't want to, um, whoops, um, want to focus solely on programming, which takes a long time to learn. So I am going to go to my next slide. And here's a brief layout of my webinar. Uh, I'm going to show an example of what we'll be t talked about, both from the uh, inspiration and about um, what the kind of end result is. And of, of course, we're going to go into the end results um, in the engine as well, because it's far more interesting. I'm going to have a blueprint breakdown and an approach on how to develop uh, a mechanic like I'm showing. And I have some uh, blueprint tips or blueprint life tips for you before I start this. Um, the one thing when you're going to be creating blueprints and stuff like that, you will make mistakes. Just, just so fail fast, do it quickly, right? As in, it's okay to fail because everyone does it. Just do it fast. Um, my second kind of quote is you use, reuse, recycle. There's no point of making the same code multiple times. If you can just copy and instead of copy and pasting it, there are ways to make it uh, reusable, like a modular kind of system. So I will be covering that a little bit as well inside of this webinar. Um, it's always good to test your tech in situations where you believe it won't work because then you will find either uh, a bug that can become a feature because why not make a bug a feature? Many games do it or you can um, fix it. And my last one is just break it. Just do whatever you can to break whatever you made to make it back there. And at the end, um, we're going to have a little Q&A. So any burning questions will be answered then. And maybe I can um, demonstrate some of the answers, uh, questions um, in engine if they are not too, uh, too complex to answer, take too much time. And it's going to roughly take about 30 to 45 minutes overall. So some of the examples of the mechanic are as seen in control. I hope the latency of the video isn't going to be lagging too much so that the videos can be seen properly but it's essentially the telekinetic ability from control where you can lift items up in the sky and you can fling them either at enemies or at walls or at things and break stuff, which is really, really satisfying. And I've kind of be, uh, been playing this game before this webinar and I thought this would be something cool to recreate because it's such a satisfying something to do. And um, at the end of the uh, webinar, I also have a link to the project where I will be sharing the zip file instead of Unreal Engine so you can kind of look at it up close and kind of break down how everything works and everything is commented out. And maybe you can even alter it to something cooler yourself. Um, so the um, simplified version instead of Unreal Engine, I am having here on loop on the videos. And uh, it's essentially the effect is stripped away uh, from the VFX. So there's no particle uh, systems going on. It's just a bare bone kind of launch, bo uh, launch object effect with a, a bit of a post-process effect on the sides of the screen where it warps. And uh, I will br briefly go over on how that works. So it's kind of that mechanic where you pick something up, it hovers next to the player, you can hold it as long as you like, and then you fire it and you can break stuff with it. Right, so with blueprints in this webinar, um, you got always, uh, with whatever you do with blueprints or not creating a mechanic, is you have to understand the problem that you are about to solve, right? You have to know kind of what you're trying to achieve. 
and you have to kind of get that mindset before you start any pr uh, problem. You can't just straight jump into something and be like, all right, cool. I'm just going to start programming and see how it works because it's going to take a long time. And then you're going to run into problems that you could have avoided by just kind of thinking beforehand. And the main way of doing something like that is with the pseudo code. So pseudo code is kind of like, um, a simplified version of code. You don't use any weird syntax. You don't have to think of to think of variables, but you kind of have to get an understanding of what you're going to do. So in this case, when I looked at control, like the video game and the stuff was being picked up. So I was displaying it for research, of course. I first had to, had to think like, how does this work? Right. As in, in pseudo terms, it was like, you find an appropriate object to pick up, right? You, you kind of have to know where it is and it has to go to somewhere where it hovers next to the player. So that's already three steps in the pseudo code. You first kind of find the object, you get the location where it initially was. You have to interpolate it to a specified location near the player to hold it and then you launch it. And in simplified terms, it can be kind of divided up in those four big steps. So I know that this mechanic, this problem, is going to have these four main steps on how it's going to behave. All right. So whatever problem you have, pseudo codes will help you understand what you will need to solve the problem. And in this case, these four ones kind of help me. And always start as simple as possible. You know your own uh, personal limitations best. So don't try and make a, a mechanic directly as complex as you can. You don't have to be the next Einstein to make a mechanic, but start as simple as possible. If you know that you can find an object and teleport it next to the player without it moving smoothly, start with that, right? As in, it first has to work and then you can move to, towards something bigger. It's like kind of a, sl a small building blocks and no need to do anything crazy. So after this webinar, if you're interested in it, in it in blueprints, maybe try to do something very simple, maybe move an object from one location to another or make something teleport. I really start with the bare bones of it, right? And how I started this mechanic, uh, what I did is I asked myself lots of questions, right? This is the thing when you're visually scripting, you always have to kind of keep asking yourself questions to kind of keep improving and find solutions to um, the problems. And usually by asking yourself loads of questions, you can also negate a lot of stuff where you're like, well, I wanted to do something cool, but how necessary is it? Right? How complex does this actually need to be? So, and you can ask yourself questions like what type of objects can actually be grabbed? Um, do they have to be a specific size? Do they have to be a specific shape, color? And when you ask those questions, you, you often tend to go towards a side that is a little bit more simplified, a little bit more easy, where you don't want to make it too complicated for yourself because it's easy to make. And also you have to think into the long term if artists use something like this, um, you want to make it easy to use, right? You don't want to have lots of buttons you have to click before you can do anything because it just becomes a pain to work with. And a big thing about ease of artist access when creating things is to have to avoid others of having to use any code because oftentimes people are kind of scared off a little bit by code. So we want to try and avoid that as much as possible. And then there the often quest uh, asked uh, visual scripting questions, how often will this mechanic be used? Rarely, only in particular situation or always. And you can see here that it talks about event tick. Now, if you don't know what it is yet, I will explain once I'm in the editor. And basically the gist of this is try to avoid event tick whenever you can, because it's expensive. But in the engine, uh, it will make a little bit more sense, but sometimes you can use it. And before I jump into the actual engine, I got to cover a little bit of, you might find it boring, you might find it very interesting. It is the, the basics of vector maps to help you understand what's going on. So when doing blueprints, vector maps is kind of like the core of any location based kind of problems. And you, uh, once you have a good grasp of how vectors work, you can basically make anything move in any direction. 
which can make things very, very interesting. So how vector maps work. And you probably know this from high school and it was painful or uh, primary school. I don't know when this is learned anymore, but I know that I hated graphs and lines and vectors and I didn't understand them until I started playing around with them in video games. And suddenly they became very, very cool and interesting. And I wish they were taught in this kind of way. Well, obviously first you have to look at the numbers and then afterwards we can look at them in a, like a 3D context. So um, addition for vector maps and subtraction uh, is crucial to understand when moving objects around the scene, how they are added and subtracted and locations are expressed in a coordinate system of X, Y, and Z, where in real X is forward, Y is to the right and Z is up and dependent on your digital content creation, this, uh, this can vary a little bit of what, what the up axis is, but I believe that uh, Unreal Engine was developed for arch architectural visualization initially, or that was the kind of like the grounding for it, that they have a top-down view, so X and Y were forward and right, and the extra axis Z was uh, then up, where I think in Maya is from a 2D perspective where you're looking forward where Z is then the depth and Y was right and X is, no, Y is up and X is right. Anyway, but uh, behaviors in terms of vector maps, doesn't matter if it's in 2D or 3D, they all behave the same way. So um, here I'm looking at the addition of vector maps. And if we move vectors around, it becomes visually a little bit more interesting to read. So I have a vector on this graph. I hope it is visible. It is kind of going to 2.2, so two points to the right, three up and it's pointing at uh, this location over here. And I have vector two, B point is going further to the right and a little bit down. But if you add to them together, you see this blue line and visually you can represent that essentially you kind of connect the tail of one vector to the other in the same direction it was going and you get the new location. Now, why this is so important is because in uh, video games, things are placed in the context of the world. Like everything has a location. Uh, there's a center of the world, which will be zero, zero, zero. And the player might be at a particular uh, place, like let's say it's in place A. And your object um, might be at A plus B, like a certain distance away. And you can figure out how, uh, where that is, or you, then you can find out where the player location is relative to it, by let's say something as subtracting. Right, where you have one location, which is six to the right, five up as uh, location one. Location two is two to the right, three up. And if you take them away from each other, you get this new location. And um, all cool and well. And that's kind of how vectors work, um, which is just basic uh, subtraction and addition, but then relative to their kind of channels. Now, one of the probably most fundamental things is we can add, we can subtract, we can let the engine do that so we don't actually have to calculate. We kind of have to roughly visualize where things are going to go. But this, uh, the idea of normalized vectors, you probably, if you do a tutorial somewhere or reading about vector maps or you're looking at someone's code or some blueprints, normalized vectors tend to come up quite a lot. Because uh, normalized vectors, they're unit vectors and they have a particular length. And they're very, very important because they can define a direction of a vector without a magnitude, right? Which is a constant for calculations and it avoids the chance of a division by zero. And the reason why this is so good, right? If we are wanting to say like, say, this is where the player is looking and we want to find directly the, uh, where the player is looking, but then hundreds units further, like uh, let's say a meter in front of him, what we can do is we can take that normalized vector in the direction and then multiply it by 100. And there we go. And we have the, uh, the exact location. Now, if we had a vector that was the length of two and you multiply it by 100, you suddenly have 200. And that is very unpredictable. Um, I put some of the maps in here just because if you like to see it, you can see it. But then, um, 
I personally, I, I'm quite interested in it, but it's like, it can be quite overwhelming or we can look at it in a nice way of blueprints where it's just a note that just says normalize and it does all the maps for you and you don't have to worry about it. All right, but if you actually wanted to by hand check some things and is this actually working? How do the numbers work? You can just type them in. These formulas you can find by researching online a little bit. Now, from a game perspective, this is what I was talking about earlier, right? The camera, uh, so as in, in terms of concept of a line trace, the camera is where the player is, where the player is looking or currently is, is an X, Y, Z. So that's the actor location where the cam camera is. The red arrow, that's the forward vector of the player. That's where they're looking. It's a unit vector, so it doesn't have any magnitude. It's just simply saying a direction. And then what you can do, you can find that location, what I was talking about earlier, but where maybe you want the trace to end or you want to find this particular location. You find the actor location, you find the forward factor, you multiply the forward factor by the offset, so about, let's say, 100 units, and you add that on top of the actor location, and you have this new location, all right? Which then is all fair and well, and I will show you in the editor how that works as well. Um, kind of in a real-time perspective and I will show you in a detailed step kind of where you can find these numbers. All right, and the offset here in this case will be a, a float value which in programming terms is uh, just anything with a decimal place like 1.2 or 100.5 or 200.235 and just etc. It's, it's something that has a decimal place behind it. So you can move it like a centimeter and a half, if you like. Right, now we're going to jump into the editor because otherwise you're going to just be looking at this slide for forever. And let's hope that everything works and that everyone can see everything because here I have a working example of the mechanic where I have my character in my 3D scene. And I can look at his objects which are highlighted, which one I can pick up. And if I click one of my buttons, like left mouse click, it picks it up and it hovers next to me. I can carry it with me. If I want, I can shoot it away. And I can pick it up, I can shoot it through a window or I can shoot it in a distance against one of these characters. And if I actually hit it, oh, there he goes. All, right. all of these kind of interactions are all done using uh, blueprints as in there's no uh, C++ needed or anything. And I also have a mechanic that it can actually find this object then finds a way towards the player. It doesn't always work as smooth as it likes, but there we go. It's not very clever, but it works. And you can also pick up canisters, throw them and make them explode. And they all work with the same kind of core mechanic. And as an artist, it's very, very easy to use because the only thing you need to do for this object to work is in the details panel, this object just has to be a physics object. So I can find any object that I like. If I want a cylinder to be used, I'm just gonna click simulate physics. And now I can pick this item up. Oh, I missed it, there we go. And I can fire this object. And that is what I mean by uh, um, artist access and easy usability, All right? So I'm gonna jump into the blueprint, which is fairly large. Mm -hmm. And there is quite, quite a bit of information in it. And from a first perspective, it doesn't look too big, but all of these functions kind of for readability are nested on the side. And once you have the project yourself, you will be able to kind of go through them and look how everything works. But I'm gonna start here with the event tick, which is the infamous uh, one that I was talking about. And this is the one that you usually want to avoid because what event tick essentially is, is something that gets called every frame of, uh, of the game. Where we all know that games run in, in FPS, or like 30 FPS or 60 FPS. So that means that all of this code is run, let's say if a game runs a 60 FPS, this, this is um, executed about 60 times per second, which is a lot. And usually you wanna try and avoid this. So if there are different ways of doing this then I would suggest to. All right, now a, bit, a little bit about how this uh, mechanic works. Um, I was talking about the line trace er earlier. 
And there's a good note for this inside of Unreal Engine called Capture Trace, or you can also use a, a line trace by channel and a visual representation for this would be for one frame. I'm gonna change it. And you can see here that from the camera, it is finding that location and shooting it in a direction. All right, if I, if I look at an object, you can see here that this is why the object is being highlighted or um, targeted because of this line trace, it finds that object. And here it kind of breaks the result, it finds the actor that was hit, and it's gonna search for actors that are from a particular type, and it's gonna store that. And it's gonna run a few uh, more tests, essentially going to store whatever one is closer to it, right? Because it is a possibility that uh, you're looking at multiple things. Now, you might notice that if I'm looking at the ground here, it is still highlighting the object at the right, which is close by. Because what I wanted is that, well, let's say you're running around and you want the player to, um, to pick something up in a, in a stressful situation to uh, attack a player. Right? You don't want to have, have the player to look particularly at a specific object or maybe close to it. And that's uh, me asking myself questions like, do I want to make it a little bit easier for the player to pick these items up? Or do, do they need a bit of a guide? Do they need to have a bit of a leeway? And the best solution or the easiest solution that I came up for this was to do a secondary check. If nothing is directly hit, then what is going to happen is it spawns a circle on the floor and it's going to find anything that is nearby it. Right, and you can see that it's checking. You see these little little red dots? And they're essentially checking if I go out of my, it's basically going to find whichever dot here is the closest by. As in, it knows that this, this object has been hit. If I move it out of it, a little red dot disappears. Um, and it's going to filter through and find out which one is closer by just doing a simple check. Oh, it finds, um, the distance of the object uh, from uh, the trace point and from the location where it initially was, I subtract them so you get a, a vector that has a magnitude to it. You convert it to a vector length and then it's going to compare them to the rest of them. So it's going to do that for each of the objects that is grabbed and it's going to store them and whichever is closest, that's going to be the last one left and that's the one that it picks up. So if I have my um, trace there in the middle, the one that is closer is going to be picked up. And that's the one that you can fire. So line traces um, is, is usually a technique that's very often used behind the scenes to try and figure out uh, sort of gameplay mechanics like things like climbing video games are usually done by tracing, shooting, um, just searching for objects, making sure that the player is looking at something to um, activate a particular event. It's all done using traces. Um, they are sometimes quite expensive because um, they, they tend to be uh, run every frame or uh, every other frame or so. And it takes quite a bit of compute, compute, computational power and you don't wanna do this too often. So if you can avoid it, uh, try to, but in this case, because this mechanic is constantly being used, you're constantly looking for um, items to be picked up. It is okay to use it, but just make sure that only the code is run, which is necessary. Because in this case, I've run my initial trace and see if, if, if something is hit, if something is found, it's gonna branch it off and it's gonna just instantly store this and there's no need to run a secondary trace, where only the secondary trace runs if nothing has been found. So in that way you can kind of optimize your code. Now, the next part is um, actually getting the item to the player, which is nested into a function, because if everything was laid out into this uh, big graph, it would be quite difficult to read. Now I have a slide talking about functions as well, uh, but I think I might just skip over it because I might just 
explain it here. And functions here are uh, kind of stored to the left hand side of my editor under functions. And if I double click on one of these, you can see that it's kind of like a separate graph. Now it's only three notes in it, but basically the thing you want to do is try and limit uh, how much happens in one function so that you can reuse them later on. Now I have a couple of functions like uh, the YZ wobble, which essentially the only thing it does is it uh, has a sine wave. So um, if you know what a sine wave does, it just kind of interpolates between zero or negative one and one over specified time. And I've used a sine wave to kind of like stretch it out, but add it to a location to give that wobble. So uh, if you see here, if I grab this object, whip, and it kind of goes up and down a little bit, and that is that wobble. And I have to do this in multiple uh, situations where when I'm doing calculations with it, I have to compare different things. So I don't want to have to copy and paste this code, but I have to kind of want to use it once. So that's why it is in a function so that I don't have to use it again, or I don't have to copy and paste the code again or make the code again. I can just drag in that function and it can drag that in anywhere to use it. So in this case, um, here I'm preparing the object. And this is a really cool note that might be quite interesting to remember to use, which is called set use CCD, which is uh, continuous collision detection. Now I didn't really know about this before I started working on this uh, mechanic. So whatever you're doing, usually you will learn things when creating a new mechanic that you didn't know were possible before. And before I knew about this problem or about this note, um, when I was, whenever I was having objects and I was shooting them away, they were uh, going through walls and they were just disappearing. And I was like, there must be a way to fix this. And with the right amount of Googling, you can find anything. All right, it might take a little bit of time, but a big part about um, visual scripting or uh, um, finding solutions to things is being able to Google properly because there's no way you're going to know everything from the start and it's okay to Google. It's just a giant library with answers for you and people that have had similar problems. So continuous collision detection is something really nice if you do, do stuff with physics. Okay. Now the next thing is, um, I actually uh, was uh, going the wrong way. I was going to the firing first rather than uh, the preparation. That's because I'm getting too much into my function. But the uh, the start here, this is the extra start. Um, what it does, it checks if an item has been grabbed. If not, what we're going to do is we're gonna find the uh, nearest physical components and check if it's valid or not. Uh, this is always good to do because you don't want your code to run when you can't actually make it run. So you're going to check the nearest fixed component if it's valid and this node can just be spawned for anything and if you want to check it. So let's say if I want to check if this works, I can just drag from the variable and type is valid and I spawn this and then make sure that the code only runs when this is the case. All right. And then I just store some variables and say like, yes, the item is grabbed. It's the first time it's grabbed and I'm running a timer by function name. Now this is one way around using uh, event tick because I could use this always behind event tick, right? I could maybe branch it off and say, only let this code run whenever I need it to with a branch, but then everything gets nested in here. Let's say I do something wrong and the code is run when it doesn't need to be. A way around it is using functions by uh, by name, so timer by function name, where I'm running this still every frame, but only when I want to. So only when an item is grabbed, this is run. And it's connected to a handle. And this handle is going to say, I'm going to let this timer keep running, or I'm going to stop it from running. Then I can essentially clear all the physics of this object. I'm going to disable the gravity, and I'm going to spawn my... Uh, radical. So that's a little thing that you see moving in the background. And uh, I make sure that's hidden from the start. All right. Now the important thing is this function of the code here is just setting everything up. Now here, this is a very long function name. 
called update launch object location, where you can directly call functions inside of the editor rather than have to drag them in. Uh, this directly calls it here from the side because it doesn't have to uh, it doesn't have to be um, visually direct, directly connected to it for it to work, but it can also function just indirectly. And what I've done here is build a little timer um, using the rule delta seconds, which is um, the time that has elapsed for the last frame. And if you keep adding them on top of each other, it will work essentially as a, as a timer in seconds. And then what it's going to do is it's going to do two things over here. Um, so once you have your hands on the little project yourself, you can take a look at this in, a, in more depth and kind of look at the maths behind it. But essentially all it's doing is the same kind of vector maps that I was doing before, right? I have an initial location where the object was. I have a location where I wanted to go to. And what I'm going to do, I'm, I can turn that into a direction it has to move towards. I have a distance that it has to move towards and multiply that based on a timer or an alpha, where if I, if the timer has been running for zero seconds, it's gonna stay where it was. And when it's run for one second, it's going to be at the location where it needs to be. And it's just going to lurk those two locations. So the initial location is where it was. And a lerp is just a blend between um, zero, one, where if it's zero, it's going to use A. Where it's, if it's one, it's going to use B. It's going to store that. And here's the wobble that I've talked about earlier. It's going to add that to it and it's going to move the actor towards it. Now I do a very similar thing here. Now the difference about it is this here moves it. Um, um, so the first part was it moves it up where if I can actually slow this down, I think. Um, let me quickly check. Do, 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 do. I can do this over here. And um, do, do, do. Set, on, set orange object. Where was it? And this is the thing. Sometimes you have to on the launch uh, health time find references and where it's first going to set it. Oh, and I'm getting lost in my own code. And this is why uh, another reason why you have to keep things clean. Uh, but essentially the first part was where you lift it up, where it goes up in the sky a little bit. And the second part of the mechanic is where it moves towards the player. And I've broken that up in, um, what's that? I've broken it up in two parts where this does the maths for moving it up and this does the maths for uh, moving it towards the player. Because you don't, if you do it all in one go, it might get too confusing where you could see me getting lost a little bit already because I, it's been a little while before I, since I've looked at the code. But uh, it's all using that same uh, vector maps. Now, once it updates the location, there's something uh, else that's cool that I wanted to show was um, figuring out where the object is going to hit. So this is uh, the predictive location that it was done using the radical, right? You can see it being at a particular location. And if you move your camera around, you can see it moving. And this is where the item is going to go. Now, I thought for a little bit about like maybe of how figuring out where, um, how I'm going to display to the player where this item is going to go. Because you can make a straight line and do an approximation. but Sometimes if you like to say you're doing this in a gameplay, you're under high stress. You kind of really want to know where this object is going to go. So I was thinking about this as in what is the best way to try and figure this out? And um, 
because I knew that I was going to fire my object uh, using uh, the physics inside of Unreal Engine. And I knew that I wanted to fire it in a particular direction with a particular strength. I was like, maybe there is a way um, for me to kind of like predict where it's going to go. So um, set physics linear velocity is the one that takes care of actually firing it and setting the velocity. So I've already figured out how strong it's going to be. I just want to have like a prediction before I actually fire it. And that can be done by using the predict projectile path by object type. And if I visualize that, then if I grab this, you can see those um, little spheres that are essentially telling me where this object is roughly going to go. And because I have set the velocity to a particular setting and because I'm using the exact same vari uh, variables or the exact same data for both of them, it's going to give me a, a almost perfect uh, display of where this is going to go. And all, all I'm going to do is at the end, break this trace and find the impact point and set the reticle uh, to that location. And here you can see that at the end of this trace, you can see where this is going to go. And you can fire it. And there are a few other things in here, as in uh, we have things um, um, like debugging. That was something that I was wanted to talk about, which is very important for uh, creating your visual scripts. Um, or debugging is essentially where you have visual references of what you're um, not what you're trying to do, but as like the numbers that are being used. Or let's say you're using two numbers and you want to see if they match up, or you want to see where something goes wrong. And debugging is a very good way of doing that. And the best way to debug in um, the um, in blueprints is using something called print string, where basically it will print to the screen your values that you plug in, and you can see if that works. So what I've done here, this object, because I wanted to know if my predicted velocity was exactly the same to my firing velocity, one the moment I grab this object, um, it prints out to the top left of my screen the two um, strengths in velocity. And you can always uh, also see them under window, uh, developer tools, and output log. If I drag this in here, you get a whole lot of text. But essentially here, the two things that I highlight here, you can always check back and see what those values actually are. And it even tells you from which objects they come from and which ones spit them out. So if something is going wrong in your code and you're not quite sure why, just take the variable, if it's a location, if it's a velocity, whatever you, you like, just print it to the screen and then you have a visual reference of what's going on. Uh, with um, debugging, there is also, um, so if I run this, if I drag this to the side of my screen, um, there's also the blueprint itself. Right, as in you can you can keep the blueprint open here on the side and actually check the flow of how everything works. If I now grab an object, I probably should have. If I zoom in a little bit, usually what it does, it should highlight the code that is actually being executed. And of course, it doesn't when I actually display it. Uh, neon debug object selected if I move this to the side. If I run this, I'm going to say the third person character. There we go. That's a little bit better. You can see this little red line firing the, uh, the physics check. So if I actually jump in there now, double click on this, you can see that it's running through the code. You can see where it's going to go and you see which path it's going to take. And here you see that nothing is being hit. And that's also a good way for debugging. 
and to have a visual representation representation of which code is running. And this has helped me quite a few times when certain things I thought they should be running, but they weren't. And so I just quickly run the game and get into a situation where I know it's predictable and I know how it should work. And then I can quickly check. So here you can see that it runs through that loop and actually stores the, uh, the item that it needs to. Um, I know we're a little bit um, short on time as in it's a lot to cover in one go. Um, but uh, one more thing that I really wanted to show and which is really fundamental to blueprints is uh, blueprint um, interfaces, which is kind of like an email, emailing system between blueprints where you can send data from one to another. Because you might wonder, well, I know that um, this character sends a message to, um, oh, this is not doing, uh, using um, Blueprint interfaces, just custom event, but there are two ways essentially. Uh, there are custom events using a cost to and a Blueprint interface um, mode, where cost to is uh, directly referencing one particular object. So you can see here cost to velocity tracker, and that works only with one object and can fire an event. But a more uh, elegant way is using a blueprint interface, right? Um, where essentially this is an emailing system. So if I type in here, let's say uh, fire. And as long as uh, my object that has this blueprint interface connected to it, can receive this message, I can send it whenever I like. So what I can do is in here, let's say um, on the class settings, it has an interface for launch objects. And it's very, very simple to uh, set up and it's up in here, fire, event fire from the blueprint interface. And I just print to the screen, hello, for debugging to check if it works. From my third person character, what I can do now, rather than running this code, I press alt click to disconnect it. I can type in fire as a uh, message and select that. I turned context sensitive off and the object I'm going to send it to is my nearest physics actor. And then when I run this code and fire that, it will now print hello on the screen. And blueprint interfaces are then a very quick way where you can send a message to any blueprint that has this emailing system connected to it. And the way you create this is simply by right clicking, going to blueprints and blueprint interface. And I think that's one of the things I struggled the most with when I initially was um, creating blueprints. And how do I get actually get these two together? And that's just using blueprint interfaces. Also, in the future, uh, the more you start playing around with it, um, cost two nodes are very, very inefficient because they get a reference to the whole object and they have to have all of the data before you can do anything. So blueprint interfaces are the way to go. Um, and um, cost two nodes are also hard object references. So if you start making a game and you're interested in it using blueprints, better off using blueprint inter interfaces because harsh references, every time let's say this actor is loaded, it is forced to load everything else that is a hard reference. So it's like this uh, velocity tracker. Let's say I have a thousand of them in the scene. The moment I load the player, I have to also load all of these thousand velocity trackers. And that can take a long time and you don't want the player to wait for 20 minutes before they can actually go in their game where it's much easier if you use a blueprint interface. It would uh, step-by-step load them and only load them when they're necessary, which um, can help your game significantly. And I know that sometimes I go on a little bit of a tangent, so I'm just gonna check um, if I've covered things, I've covered functions, I've covered blueprint interfaces. Oh, yeah, and here, of course, because we're already on 45 minutes, it goes so quickly. Um, the things that I haven't covered but are inside of the scene are destructible meshes using an Apex destru uh, destruction plugin, post-process materials, 
uh, material creation, Fresnel and depth faith, particle systems, a transfer tool plugin, game modes, and the input for the player. But what you can do, I will give the files and you can go through it and kind of like break it down little bit by little bit on how it actually works. Or in the last kind of 15 minutes, you can ask a question about it and I will try and answer um, about how that works. And um, does anyone have any questions for me to answer or is everyone a little bit overwhelmed, too much information? And that is fine too. And just want to kind of like take your time and look at the project um, at the side. Uh, let's see. And if there are no questions, that is completely fine. And then in the meantime, I am going to be looking for my link where you can get a hold of this project, which is zip file, and just make sure that you have um, Unreal Engine 4.2. 25 installed and you should be able to use this. So I'm going to create a link, a shareable link, copy. And I'm going to paste that in the chat for everyone to use. So that is on Google Drive. And if there are no questions, I'm just going to hang around here. Then um, And that will be kind of the end of the webinar. Oh, and here are also some uh, links. Um, I might as well use uh, share the slides as well. Don't see the links to all, pa oh, to all panelists. Um, let's say to all panelists and then attendees. Thank you for telling me, Max. Here you go. You should be able to see the link now. Get share a link. I'm also going to send you a link to the presentation itself because then you can have, if you're interested in it, you can have a look at um, kind of like the things that work behind it, like apex destruction, uh, vector maps, soft and hard object references, which is quite um, quite intense to watch and a breakdown of like what uh, blueprint interfaces are. And this is probably one of my favorite ones is uh, a YouTube can channel by Matthew Wettstein called WTF is where you can find most things in blueprints where he will explain how it functions. So anything that you come across into my mechanics, you might be able to, Hey, what does this note actually do? Give it a quick Google. Probably this guy will show up and he will explain how it works. And your file structure is a little bit cleaner than mine and you will be able to find uh, the maps under this main folder. And the blueprint of the player can actually be found in the third person BP. Blueprint in a third person character. Blueprint here, you can open and see how that works. Um, uh, um, yeah, yeah the, the, uh, the webinar will be available somewhere it is being recorded. And you will have, as you see, uh, access to all the files. So anything can be gone over again afterwards. Yeah. So if there are any other questions, please send ahead and then I'll answer them. If not, then uh, I would say feel free to download the files and have a little play around with it yourself start exploring blueprints and if you already know them a little bit I'd say good luck and try to make something cool the recording will be available in a couple of weeks time on our ehub and there you go Just behind the scenes sending you links on where you can find stuff and i will be if there are no questions i will be stopping sharing my screen and i would want to thank you very much for uh oh could you elaborate on the non nomenclature within blueprints and what counts as a module of functions and macro etc yeah of course that's a good question because it can be very confusing um as in what a macro or a function is right so the biggest difference between a macro and a function is that 
functions are non, they have no latency. All right, um, I think I had a little bit more information on the, uh, the slide itself as well. I have it open here. So if I go to uh, function macros, uh, functions are executed in one frame. So they cannot have any time dependent nodes. They can't be delayed. They can't have timelines in it. Uh, functions can be called by other blueprints and timers. So they don't actually necessarily have to be directly connected to uh, other nodes, but it can be called externally as well as internally. Um, they can be overridden in child blueprints and they can be turned into prior functions. So functions are very, very helpful. Uh, what macros are essentially, they are graph extensions. Uh, they, can they can have time dependent nodes and they can have multiple execution wires. And what that means is if I go in here, let's say I make a macro, I call it new macro, they name it something. I can have here have multiple execution pins Ooh. and I can run different kinds of code whenever I like. So if you have different contexts or different uh, things that happen, but you need to use this one macro in one go, you can have different inputs. And the moment you have that in your graph, like a new macro, you can fire them independently. And this is just kind of a block of code that can be reused as a, a kind of like modular code uh, that can have time dependencies. Functions do not have time dependencies. And that those are kind of like the main difference. So I would almost always go for a function as well because it can be turned into a pure function. But if you have to have a little bit more flow control and uh, more choices, macros are pretty good. What you can also do is uh, in the graph, this is really cool instead of Unreal, let's say uh, you've been working on it and you have uh, too much code going on in one go. What I've done with the base code from this blueprint, you can actually collapse a graph and you can nest events in there as well. Now the thing is with functions, uh, functions are, are essentially events, but in macros you can't call events because if I type in here event, and I can't um, find anything in here and it can't be called in there. But if you wanna purely use it for collapsing information, what you can do is uh, you can just select a bunch of code, say, I have this code right here. I just right, uh, I can right click it and collapse uh, notes and it turns it into one nicely cleaned up graph and will turn it into its own graph. Now, if I try to turn this into a function, like let's say I select this part here is a function. If I collapse the function, it won't work because uh, it's time dependent. Cool, uh, another question say, uh, for Max, I'm a newcomer to Unreal, so forgive me if this is a dumb question. There are no dumb questions though, no possible. And it's to optimize performance. Do you disable physics of an object while it's being held by the player? Or is this Unreal physics engine optimized enough for it to not matter? So in this case, I uh, turned off, I think I did turn off the physics the moment it's being grabbed. Let me just double check. So the naval gravity, uh, I think in this case, I didn't turn the physics off because I was finding some um, odd behaviors with it the moment I fired it from turning physics on and off, things weren't going right. But the moment objects, uh, which you could do to optimize this, it's actually a very good question because physics uh, can be quite expensive, especially if you have a lot of stuff in the scene at once. So if you wanna take this a step further, these objects are currently just physics objects. But what you could do is you could, check for their velocity. If it's below a certain speed, you can actually turn physics off yourself. That's quite easily done. So uh, under event tick, what I could do is get velocity. Uh, if I get the vector length, length, and if this is, let's say below or equal to uh, a certain threshold, let's say 100, what I can do is yeah, do it once and I can turn uh, set physics enabled. Ooh. No, not physics enabled, Sim set simulate, set simulate physics. 
is x for the static mesh to off. And that will automatically turn it off for you. Uh, so actually, to answer the question in a bit more depth, the Unreal isn't optimized to the point that uh, physics actors automatically stop calculating. You will have to specifically tell them to stop calculating because it's going to assume that if you say that this is object is physics stemming, that it will continue to do so because it doesn't want to turn it off before uh, it's important. And that's the same with uh, conti continuous collision detection, which is a very expensive way of uh, using your physics actor. You also want to turn this off after you've stopped using this object if it's going below a certain speed. And you will have to make those optimi optimizations yourself. And I hope that answers your question. Cool. Nice. And we are nearing six o'clock. If there are no other questions, then uh, I'll be shooing off and I'll let you play with uh, the content that you have received. And maybe even try to find it in, uh, get some free uh, content. Okay, cool. No worries, Jack. I'm glad that I, uh, it could be of help. Yeah, make a little scene and see uh, how this mechanic works inside of it. I know that there are some uh, issues within it when there are lots of objects nearby. And uh, if you have the time, one interesting thing to look into that I didn't get to cover was um, figuring out how to move the object right to a new location, uh, which was under to do update launch object location and there's here new launch path find new path look into this code if you're interested and this is kind of like a cool cycle that figures out the new path of the uh, object if it's stuck somewhere and that's where i'm gonna leave it cool all right thank you for coming everyone <laughs>